Hi, my name is Joy Ting and I'm the Research Enologist and Extension Coordinator for the Winemakers Research Exchange and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019-2020 season of the WRE. The vision of the WRE is to promote innovation through experimentation and education in the wine industry and the primary instrument for doing this is through your experiments. So this video and the email that came with it is the official call for proposals for experiments for this season. The quality of our results are only as strong as our experimental design. So to help you to think about which experiments you want to do and how to set them up, I've prepared a few slides to guide you through the process of experimental design. It's not too hard to design a good experiment, but we do need to think about a few elements along the way. Before we start though, I want to think about, I want to talk a little bit about why you should consider doing an experiment through the WRE this year. There's a couple of different ways to think about it. You might be trying to avoid a particular type of error or solve a particular problem in your winery. You may be trying to move the needle toward higher quality in your winery by trying new things. Or you might just like the intellectual satisfaction and stimulation that comes with doing experiments. But more practically, we can also think about the fact that Virginia is still pretty early in our development as a wine region. We still have a long way to go to build a reputation of making consistently good wines, and most of us are dreaming about how we can make great wines. Experimentation drives us to keep questioning what we're doing and why we're doing that. We can always look to the literature to see what's already known, and that's an important step. But most of that work wasn't done here in our unique climate. Through WRE experiments, we ask what are the best techniques that we can bring to bear to make the best Virginia wines possible. When we think about WRE experiments, a few characteristics come to mind that really constitute a great experiment. The first characteristic is that it's of interest to you, the experimenter. To take all of the time and energy needed to do a good experiment, you have to really care about the outcome. Another characteristic is that it's broadly applicable and that it's of interest to others. One of the strengths of the WRE and the reasons that the WRE is a good investment for the wine board is that we all learn from each other, accelerating progress and sharing ideas. WRE experiments are also practical. The overall goal is to produce better wines, and the best interventions are the ones that you would actually put into practice in your vineyard or your winery. Great WRE experiments are also production scale. There's a lot of research that's already been done on small fermentations in lab settings. These have been essential to our understanding of fermentation. But ultimately, what happens in a five-ton fermenter is very different from what happens in a flask. The role of the WRE is to help bridge that gap. Now, depending on the level of interest, the WRE may or may not be able to provide funding support for all of the projects that are submitted this year. The criteria for selection for funding have been posted on our website, but reflect these priorities. It's our goal to have as many participants as possible doing experiments. So if you've not done an experiment before and want to jump in, this is a great time to do that. Now, before we start talking about the experimental design itself, I'd like you to pause the video and collect three things. To, to go forward, you'll need a writing utensil, a blank piece of paper, and a copy of the proposal handout that was included in this email. With these, you'll be able to complete your experimental design as you watch the rest of the video. Okay, now that you've collected your materials, it's time to get to the fun part, designing our experiments. So you've already seen an email with possible themes for experiment experimentation for this year. Any of these themes could be made into great experiments. The idea of the themes is to focus several experiments around a topic so that we can include background information and focus discussion during our sensory sessions. Focusing around themes also presents the potential to have replication for our experiments. 
I've listed the topics here and there's more detailed descriptions of each topic on the website. The topics themselves are left a little bit broad so that you can tailor the details of the experiment to your particular situation. So for example, if you're looking to reduce volatile acidity in your finished wines, perhaps theme number seven, looking at interventions at Crush to re reduce microbial load would be a good option for you. I encourage you to read over the themes here as they're listed here and as they're listed on the website to see if there's anything that interests you. If you're, however, you're not limited to these themes, if there's another question that you want to explore. Whether you want to work on one of these themes or if you want to do a unique experiment, the steps of experimental design are mostly the same. So the first step of experimental design is to identify our question. And what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes to brainstorm a list of questions or concerns or interests that you currently have in your vineyard or your winery. It's okay to be broad for now because we'll spend some time refining our questions later. So these could be things that came out of an article you read, out of a WRE sensory session that you went to, something that you heard about or learned about at VBA. So some of the examples that, some examples of what you might write down would be, how can I improve the quality of grapes coming from my vineyard? How can I prevent VA in my finished wines? How can I add body and mouthfeel to my Cabernet Franc? How do I know when my grapes are at peak ripeness to pick? Open-ended questions are great. Is there a better way to fill in the blank and see what, how you want to fill in that blank? Or I heard so-and-so does this and that. Should I be doing that? This is a great time also to write down a list of products or techniques or a piece of equipment that you'd like to learn how to use. So what I'd like you to do at this point is pause the video, take out that blank sheet of paper that you collected earlier, and take a few minutes just to brainstorm a list of things that are of interest to you right now in your vineyard or winery. Now that you have your list of brainstormed ideas, I want you to look over your list and choose one of those ideas that's most exciting or interesting to you or that you're most likely to actually apply to your own vineyard or winemaking. I know you want to do more than one of those. For right now, choose just one as an example to go through the rest of the video. Then I want you to look at that particular question. Let's say, for example, my question is, how do I make my Cabernet Franc better? So the next step is to refine our question to be more specific. How do I make my Cabernet Franc better is too broad to design an experiment for. In this case, I need to define what does better even mean. Do I want my Cabernet Franc to be fruitier or more structured? Do I want it to be more concentrated or more herbal? A more refined question would be, how do I make my Cabernet Franc more structured? Once you've refined your question, you want to start to think about what particular interventions might help to answer that question. So again, in my Cabernet Franc example, how do I make my Cabernet Franc more structured? What interventions could I do to improve the structure of my Cabernet Franc? Well, I might think about adding stems to my Cabernet Franc. I might think about adding artificial or extra tannin to my Cabernet Franc. I might think about extended maceration as a way of adding structure to my cab franc. Now this is an example where a little bit of research can go a long way. A, many of times we're asking questions that have already been addressed by previous experiments and making ourselves aware of what's already known can save us time in trying things that have already been shown not to work. It can also reveal to us additional options that we didn't even know existed. This is one place where I can help. If you have a great experimental question that you want to explore, but you need help finding interventions, or if you want to know what's already been studied on our particular intervention, please let me know and I'm happy to look some things up for you. Okay, now that you have your list of interventions, I want you to choose one of them that's most interesting to you or that you're more, most likely to be able to apply in your own situation. 
Again, it's okay to go back and do this again for other interventions, but for the sake of our example, choose one of them. So in my example, I'll say, um, I'm going to choose adding stems to my Cabernet Franc to improve structure. So once you've looked at your particular interventions and you've chosen one of them, it's time to formulate an actual hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a predictive statement that's going to help us to structure our experiment going forward. Usually a hypothesis takes on the structure of an if-then statement. So if I add stems to my Cabernet Franc, then my wine will be more structured. So go ahead and write out your hypothesis based on the question you're looking at and the intervention that you've chosen to explore. Now that you have your experimental question and your hypothesis, we need to think about how to set up the experiment itself. So the first thing we need to think about are the treatments. And that's essentially whatever you filled in that first blank with. It's the thing that you'll be altering in your experiment. In science speak, we call this the independent variable. In my example, if I add stems, then my Cabernet Franc will be more structured. Adding stems would be my treatment. Now, this is a good place to stop and realize that we need to be as specific as possible in describing our treatment. So for example, how will I be adding stems? How much or how many stems will be I be adding? When will I be adding stems? There's lots of different ways to do that. For example, I might add stems by adding whole clusters to my fermentation. Alternatively, I might destem my fruit and then add stems back on a particular weight by weight basis. The other thing to think about when you think about treatments is that you also need to have a control. And all that means is that you have to have at least one lot that doesn't receive the treatment in order to have a baseline to compare to. When you think about the treatment and the control, the control is oftentimes the standard procedure of the winery, and the treatment has altered one thing from the control. Again, in my example, where I want to add, add structure to my Cabernet Franc by adding stems, let's say I decided to do that by adding whole clusters to my Cabernet Franc. Well, if I really think about it, adding whole clusters adds more than just adding stems. It also adds whole berries. So if I chose that, in this case, I'd have to rephrase my hypothesis to say, if I add whole clusters, then my Cabernet Franc will be more structured. It seems like a small semantic difference at this point, but it actually becomes important when we interpret our results in the end. Another thing to think about with treatments is that treatments may, you may have multiple different levels of your treatment. So again, in my example with whole clusters, I might have a 0% whole cluster lot, a 20% whole cluster, a 40% whole cluster, and a 60% whole cluster lot. In this case, my 0% whole cluster would be my control, and then I have three different levels of treatment. It's important to realize if you're going to structure your experiment this way, that that changes the kind of sensory analysis that we can do. If you've been to a WRE sensory session, you know that the most common test that we do is the triangle test. The main question of the triangle test is, is there a difference between this wine and that wine? The triangle test is limited to only two levels, your treatment and your control. So if you set up your experiment to have multiple treatment levels, it becomes much harder to do the triangle test without doing multiple different triangle tests. You can certainly set up the experiment this way, but it's good at this stage to realize that's going to change the kind of sensory analysis that we can do in the end. So now that you have your different levels of tre treatment and your control, it's time to think about the responses. And the response is whatever you filled in that second blank with. It's the data that you'll be using to determine if a change has occurred. So again, if I add whole clusters, then my Cab Franc will be more structured. For me, the response would be additional structure in my Cabernet Franc. In science speak, we call this the dependent variable. Now, in my case, having more structure to my Cabernet Franc, that's actually a qualitative response. It's something that we can't really count or measure, 
but rather describe in, in qualitative or descriptive terms. If at all possible, it is much better to have a quantitative response to be able to know how much of a difference we've seen. So for example, in my case, I might want to, to identify responses that would help to quantify having more structure in my Cabernet Franc. For example, I might think about looking at the concentration of tannins. That's something we can count, that we can measure. We can determine how much different it is, and that's a measurement for structure. Another option would be to look at a sensory result. So to say, if my Cabernet Franc is more structured, then most likely it's going to have higher scores for astringency, for example. Now, in reality, in WRE experiments, we oftentimes take a lot more dependent variables or a lot more data at the end than just the things that we identify with our hypothesis. Really, we do that in order to make sure there's not unintended consequences of our experiment that don't fit in with the specific responses we're looking for. But it's still helpful to identify which responses are going to help to answer our experimental question at this stage. Now that you have your experimental question, your hypothesis, your treatments and control, and your responses, all that's left is to describe the experimental setup itself. Now, as we think about how to set up the experiment, we need to remember that wine is a complex thing with many different environmental and microbial variables that can affect the outcome of the fermentation. Variability can be introduced from the environment itself, from the, fruit, the source food and the juice, and from the barrels. All of this variation can complicate our conclusions and make it difficult to know if differences are due to our treatment or due to random variation. So there's a couple of different things that we can do to try to get a handle on that and tease out the differences between random variation and differences due to our treatments. The first is to control as many variables as possible. And all that means is that we try to make sure that every single thing is the same between our treatments except for the treatment itself. That means that we say that the temperature is the same for all of the treatments unless the temperature is the thing we're changing, that everything is in the same vessel, that all of the cellar operations are the same. This helps to limit the amount of variation that we see between lots. An important thing to think about here also is the fruit source. Vineyards are even more variable and introduce a lot of variation into our experiments. So if your experiment is designed so you do multiple press loads, you have to think about how to randomize the fruit coming in from your vineyard. So the difference you see isn't because this picking bin came from rows 1 through 3 and this picking bin came from row 23. It's important to randomize your fruit sourcing. Another way to deal with variation is through replication, and there's a couple of different ways that we do replication. The first is technical replication, and that just means that for each treatment we have multiple vessels that we can use for analysis. For example, we might have three barrels per treatment instead of just one barrel per, per treatment. A good example of this is an experiment that was done in 2018 looking at barrel fermented Viognier using two different yeasts. One of the yeasts completed fermentation with regular kinetics in good time. The other yeast slowed down its fermentation and stuck at 10 grams per liter. Now, if we had only had one barrel each of those yeast groups, we might think that something strange just happened in the stuck fermentation and it didn't necessarily mean anything about the yeast. But in this particular case, we had three barrels of each yeast group. The first yeast finished easily in all three barrels and the second yeast stuck at 10 grams per liter in all three barrels. That made it much more possible for us to say that the kinetics of that fermentation was indicative of the yeast itself and not just the fermentation environment. The other option for replication is what we call experimental replication, and that's doing the same experiment multiple different times. Now that might take on the form of doing the same experiment multiple years in a row. For example, the hedging 
trial at Rosemont is now on its third year. Another option is to have the same experiment done in different wineries. Again, if we see the same trend in different, in different experiments in different wineries, we're much more likely to say that that's a robust effect. A third option is to have the same experiment on different lots within the same winery. So again, in the Cabernet Franc example, if I have three different lots of Cabernet Franc come in, and for each one of those lots, I do an, an experiment comparing whole clusters um, to not whole clusters, and I see similar results, I have a much stronger conclusion than I can make. Now the last thing to think about with variation is if you have a, a part of your experiment that requires vineyard sampling. Again, vineyards are really variable places. And so in order to make sure that our, the differences we see in vineyard sampling or vineyard samples is due to the treatment itself and not just variation in the vineyard, there's a, there are a number of additional steps we take to try to account for that variation. If you have a vineyard sampling piece to your experiment, we can talk in more detail individually about how to account for that variation. Now, because barrels are such a common element to all of our experiment, I thought it would be useful to take just a little bit of time to address the variation that we can see between one barrel and another. So if we think about where that variation might be coming from, we have to think about what all goes into the making of a barrel. And it turns out that different scientific studies have found variations in barrels to, due to all kinds of different things, including the individual biology of the tree that the barrel came from. We need to remember that oak barrels come from oak trees, and different individual trees have different life histories. So we wouldn't really expect the oak from one tree to have exactly the same chemical precursors as the oak from another tree. It's been shown that the place in the forest itself is important, as is the position of the oak on the tree. And then once the oak is cut into staves, it turns out that where that stave is during the seasoning process, where it is on the stack during the seasoning process, can also affect the flavor of the wood. Once that wood is made into a barrel, it's toasted by a person. And there's always going to be some variation in exactly how long and exactly how much heat that particular barrel got, and that too can change the flavor of the barrel. Once the barrel gets to your winery, did you swell all the barrels exactly the same? Did you clean all of the barrels exactly the same? Did all of the barrels have exactly the same thing in them prior to your use for the experiment? Most likely not. So all of these things can introduce variation into the flavor of the wine that's going into the barrels. A paper from Toey and Waterhouse in 1996 investigated the differences in flavors coming from barrels and for different size lots. What they did is they had four different lots of barrels. Each lot had, was identical in the sense that it came from the same forest and the same cooper and had the same toast level. And they had four different lots of these. They had two different um, European lots and two different American lots. What they did is they fermented some Chardonnay and then aged it for seven months in these barrels. And then they sampled the wine that was in those barrels and measured seven different oak extractives. So basically flavor compounds that we know come from the oak in the barrel. What they found was if they only sampled four barrels within the 10 barrel lot, and they did that multiple times, they could have up to 30% uh, variation in the concentration of their oak extractives just by taking a four barrel sample. More concerningly, if they looked at a 10 barrel sample, they still saw about 20% variation in those concentrations and they calculated that in order to get that variation under 10%, they would have to look at 39 different barrels. To bring that home a little bit, if they just look at one barrel at a time, which is a lot of our experiments, they could see up to 50% variation in those flavor per precursors. Now, WRE experiments are not going to start to require you to do 37 different barrels in order to get a reasonable result. 
a lot of the things that we're looking at are much, um, much larger numbers than what we would expect for oak extractives. However, if at all possible, we would really love to see replication whenever possible. So at this point, if you've been following along, you should have an experimental question that you're excited to pursue, a testable hypothesis, different treatment levels and a control, response variables, and an experimental setup. Congratulations, you are all set to submit your proposal. Now before you do that though, I do want you to take a minute and review the priorities that we talked about in the beginning of this video. So look at your design. Does it answer the question that you set out to answer? Are you excited to get started to do this experiment? Is your experiment practical? And really there's two different types of practical I'd like to talk about. First of all, is the intervention that you've decided to do something that would be practical for you to apply to your winery? And secondly, is the experiment itself practical the way that you have designed it? Again, this would be one of those places if you've, des if you've got a great experimental question, but when you look over the details of your experiment, you feel like maybe this is a little bit unwieldy and I need to simplify, go ahead and see if there are some things that you can simplify along the way to make it more doable. If you want a little bit of help with that, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to help you to identify places to, to trim some of that. Is your experiment production scale? Again, do you end up with at least one barrel of finished wine in the end? That's really what we would consider to be the minimum for production scale. If you said yes to all of those questions, you are ready to submit the proposal. There's a couple of different ways that you can do that. You can go ahead and take the, the electronic document that came along with your email and just fill that out and email it to me. The same questions can be found on a Google form and there's a link to that on the email that this, the, the video came with. Or you could just email me directly or call me for help if you just wanna talk through the, the details and I'll go ahead and fill out the papers as we talk. Any one of those is a reasonable way to submit. So what you can expect from here once you submit your, your proposal, I will follow up with you and then I will formulate a budget. So the budget basically means that the WRE will be able to will plan on funding the laboratory analysis that's necessary to look at your response variables. So once we have your protocol, we can go ahead and look at what would be all of the analyses that we want to do and how much would those cost. After, the, after that's been prepared, the WRE board meets in mid-July uh, in, mid in order to look at all of the proposals. And the purpose of that meeting, first of all, is to look at all of the proposals and make sure they make sense and they're practical and they meet our, our um, expectations that way. We also look at the budget and say, do we have enough budget to fund all of these proposals? Now, if we don't have the budget to fund all of the proposals, that's where those criteria for funding that I talked about earlier come into play. And all that means is we try to make sure that we've got participants from as broad a spectrum as possible around the state. We try to make sure um, that, our, that we have replicates whenever possible. Um, and there are some other priorities that are on that piece of paper. So if there's not enough budget, that's what's decided. Once your project is funded, I will follow up with you and that's when we'll write a detailed procedure. So you'll end up before harvest, you'll get to a point where you have a procedure that says, you know, step one, step two, step three, that you and I both agree is practical and doable. It'll be clear when you need to pull samples um, and you'll get some data sheets to fill out along the way. So in order to make all of those things happen on time, I will ask that you try to get your proposals to me by the first week of July so that I have time to follow up and get the budgets done before I send those things over to the WRE board. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. If you have any questions about experiments to do this year or experimental design or any of those themes, or if you need to get a hold of me for any reason, please feel free to shoot me an email or call me on my cell phone. And again, there, most of these resources are also listed on our website, which is listed here. Thank you again.